This week, we're going to get into the respiratory system. You'll have a chance in lab to learn all of the different structures and the anatomy of this particular system. And what we're going to focus on in lecture is really more the physiology or how the system works. However, before we start getting into physiology, there are a few things about the anatomy of the respiratory system that we need to talk about. The first thing that you should know is that the respiratory system has two main divisions to it. So the first of these are structures that make up what's known as the conducting zone. And the conducting zone includes respiratory passageways, and its job basically is to take the air that's outside the body, deliver it to the lungs where we can get gas exchange with the blood, and also take carbon dioxide that has diffused from the blood into the lungs and transport it to outside of the body. So that's its primary role. But the other thing that structures of the conducting zone do is they cleanse air that's entering the body. They humidify the air because we don't want dirty air that's dry getting into the lungs. That would be really inflammatory to the lungs and potentially could make you sick. And it also works to warm the incoming air because by the time the air hits the microscopic tissues in the lungs, we want it to be at body temperature effectively. Otherwise, it's really inflammatory to the lungs. All of the conducting zone structures are what you can actually see here on this diagram. All of the structures that are visible to the naked eye of the respiratory system are conducting zone structures. They're basically respiratory passageways. The other division that we have in this particular system are what are known as respiratory zone structures. These are all microscopic. So when you're looking at a model of this particular system or a diagram of this particular system, these are things that you're not able to see with the naked eye that we've actually got to look at from a microscopic perspective. But respiratory zone structures are the structures where we've actually got gas exchange between the lungs and the blood. So I wanna use this diagram here. You can see we're starting to look at some microscopic stuff to talk about these respiratory zone structures. If you look at this picture right here, we've got a lung, we've got a bronchial or a bronchus, which brings air into the lungs. And then you'll notice that as soon as that bronchus enters the lungs, it starts to divide. And each time it divides, these respiratory passageways become smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, they divide about 20 times until we get out to little microscopic structures, which are known as terminal bronchioles. So these terminal bronchioles are out at kind of the outer parts of the lung at the end of these passageways. If we were to take terminal bronchioles and magnify them a little bit more highly, here's what we would see. So this is a terminal bronchiole. And a terminal bronchial branches into what are known as respiratory bronchioles. And respiratory bronchioles is where the respiratory zone actually begins. If you look at this picture of respiratory bronchioles, you'll notice that we have these little white circular structures that are covering them, and these are alveoli. So alveoli is the actual place where we have gas exchange between the lungs and the blood, and any structure within the lungs that's an alveolus or that has an alveolus attached to it is considered to be a respiratory zone structure. If you look right here, you've got kind of this outer segment of a respiratory bronchiole. You could imagine cutting it longitudinally. Here's what we would see. So we've got this respiratory passageway that air would enter through and then all of these alveoli that are branching off of it. And so air is able to move from this respiratory bronchiole into these air sacs. One of the things that you should notice about these air sacs or these alveoli is that they have a really thin wall. So it's actually a simple squamous epithelium that makes up the wall of the alveoli. The reason for this is this is, again, the area where gas exchange is occurring. So right outside of this wall, we have a network of blood vessels and oxygen that's inside this alveolus when we inhale is going to move through the alveolar wall and into the blood vessel. At the same time, carbon dioxide that's in the blood is going to move through this wall into the alveolus. So having a wall that's really thin because it's made up of a simple squamous epithelium allows that diffusion of these respiratory gases to happen as quickly as possible. It takes only about a third of a second for oxygen to move from the alveolus across its wall into the blood, and again about a third of a second for carbon dioxide to move from the blood into the alveolus. 
so we can get this gas exchange happening really, really rapidly because the walls of these air sacs or these alveoli is so thin. I want to talk a little bit more about the walls of the alveoli, and to do so, I want to first kind of direct your attention to this microscope slide of this tissue. This isn't magnified to where we can see it really great in this diagram, but you'll notice that we've got these little air sacs, these little circular open spaces. So when you're seeing those, these round little circular open spaces, you're looking at alveoli, and you'll notice just how very thin their walls are. So we're going to use this next slide to talk about the walls of the alveoli specifically and learn a little bit more about their function and their structure as well. So each of us have in our lungs about 400 million of these teeny tiny microscopic alveoli or air sacs. And if we were to take the walls of all of these 400 million air sacs and add up their area, we would actually have a space that's about the size of a football field. So there is a football size field, football field size, excuse me, membrane that is packed and organized into your lungs that is made up of the walls of all the alveoli collectively added together. These walls of all the alveoli in both of your lungs is what we refer to as the respiratory membrane. And the reason that we call it the respiratory membrane is it is the tissue or it is the membrane across which respiratory gases are diffusing, as I talked about with the last slide. So here we've got a microscope slide of actual respiratory membrane. It's a little bit more highly magnified so that we can see the detail a little bit better. But again, you're seeing these little circular open areas and that's where air would enter into the air sac and fill this space and then you can also see just how very thin that wall of the alveolus is it's again a simple squamous epithelium one of the things that you should know about this respiratory membrane is that it is actually made up of a couple of different cell types so the majority of the wall are what are known as type 1 cells, and that's the simple squamous epithelium that I talked about previously. However, you also have interspersed throughout this tissue some cuboidal shaped cells that secrete a chemical which is known as surfactant. Surfactant is incredibly important to the function of the lungs, and we're going to come back and talk about it with the last slide in this particular lecture, and you'll actually have a chance in the activity that you do with this folder to learn a little bit more about it because that activity is focused on surfactant. But surfactant is produced by the respiratory membrane and specifically by what are known as type 2 cells or type 2 pneumocytes that are found interspersed in that respiratory membrane. So before we get into surfactant, I want to spend a little bit of time just talking a little bit more about the alveoli and some of their features. If you look at this picture here, we are seeing actual alveoli under a microscope. You can see how teeny tiny they are, how delicate really they are. And you'll notice there's kind of this net-like mesh that's covering them, and that's the blood vessels that I talked about. So this is what allows them to be able to exchange gases with the blood because you've got this pretty dense network of blood vessels that's covering them. If you look over here, you got an artist's representation of a whole bunch of alveoli. So these are the little air sacs that fill with air. You can see, again, the artist has drawn in this mesh-like net that's covering those air sacs that's represented in red. But the other thing that I want to talk about for a minute and bring to your attention is you'll notice we've also got this yellow mesh that's covering these alveoli. This is elastic fibers. So these fibers are made up of a protein which is known as elastin that's really stretchy. And these elastic fibers have a really important role. When you breathe in, you inhale, you fill your lungs, your alveoli are going to start to fill with air and they're going to start to expand as they do so. These elastic fibers prevent them from expanding too far so that you don't actually rupture your lungs, you can't breathe in any further because they put some BRAC pressure on the alveoli. The other thing these alveoli, or these elastic fibers do that surround the alveoli is when you exhale, they have a recoil pressure that they kind of squeeze the alveolus that they surround and they help to push the air out of that alveolus and out of your lungs. The reason I want to mention these things is because they're really important to the proper functioning of the lungs. Here's an example of why. I'm sure all of you have heard of emphysema. 
Emphysema is a condition where these elastic fibers that surround the alveoli start to rupture. And when they start to rupture and break, there's nothing to prevent the alveoli from becoming overinflated. And what happens in somebody with emphysema is it actually becomes really easy for them to breathe in. And that causes an overinflation of the alveoli because the elastic fibers are missing. And it causes those alveoli to rupture. And when their walls start to rupture, you've lost that membrane in that area and it no longer is capable of exchanging respiratory gases with the blood. So people that have emphysema, because they've lost these elastic fibers, their alveoli start to rupture, they have a really hard time exhaling because there's nothing to put that back pressure on the alveoli. So it's easier for them to breathe in. They can't breathe out. It's really difficult because they've lost those elastic fibers. And so they very often tend to have a barrel chest that's associated with that, which is just actually the overinflation of the lungs that you're seeing. Because they're losing their respiratory membrane, it's overinflating and it's rupturing, it makes it hard for them to exchange gases with the blood. So carbon dioxide levels in the blood get high, oxygen levels in the blood get low because they're not able to exchange those gases. But possibly the worst thing that happens when you start to lose these fibers and it becomes very, very hard to exhale because you've lost that normal recoil is now with each exhale, you have to start contracting muscles to physically force and push that air out of the alveoli because you don't have the elastic fibers doing it for you. And we see people with emphysema using up to 30% of their body energy, just contracting muscles in the abdomen and muscles in the chest, trying to force air out of their lungs. So they tend to be really thin and really weak and tired as well because they're using so much of their energy, trying to contract muscles to actually push oxygen, sorry, carbon dioxide out of the lungs. You probably heard that emphysema is associated more with smoking, and here's why. If you smoke, it paralyzes structures in the respiratory passageways, so in those conducting zone structures that are there to get oxygen down into the alveoli. And the structures that it paralyzes are tissues that tend to sweep mucus and debris and any bacteria that have gotten down into there out of the lungs and out of the respiratory passageways. Well, if you paralyze those structures, those cilia that normally would do this for you, now they're not able to sweep out dust and pathogens and pollen and pollutants and all of those types of things. And instead, those things get down into your lungs, they cause respiratory infection. Anytime you have infection, as you guys have learned, you get swelling. And when you get swelling, that puts pressure on these elastic fibers. Then your body heals, you get over the respiratory infection, everything goes back to normal. But those cilia are still paralyzed, so you get another infection not too much after that, which causes the swelling to repeat and the healing. And your lungs can really go through only so many of these cycles of being inflamed and then healing, being inflamed and then healing before these elastic fibers start to wear out and start to snap. And that, again, is what leads to emphysema and why emphysema is associated with smoking. Because smokers tend to get more respiratory infections because they've paralyzed through chemicals that are in cigarette smoke, the cilia on the tissues that would otherwise be sweeping gunk out of their lungs, and that gunk instead goes into the lungs and it causes more commonly infections in smokers as compared to non-smokers. So here's the last slide. I want to come back to talking about pulmonary surfactant a little bit. I mentioned previously that pulmonary surfactant is really important to the function of the lungs. Without pulmonary surfactant, we actually would not be able to inflate our lungs, and we'd actually end up in a situation where just the process of breathing would end up tearing our lungs. So you're going to look at this particular situation with the activity that you do today. But I want to go into a little bit why pulmonary surfactant is necessary within the lungs. 
So in the lungs, you have this microscopic, very, very thin tissue, and the lungs are a really high humidity environment as well. So they're at about 100% humidity, which means that we've got lots and lots and lots of water molecules that are hanging out in the lungs. So to understand why pulmonary surfactant is needed, you really need to have an understanding of water chemistry, and you'll get a chance to do this, to walk through this in the activity that you do this week. I'm going to give you kind of a quick little preview to this. So this is a water molecule. I always think they look like Mickey Mouse. A water molecule is made of one oxygen atom, which is represented in blue, and two hydrogen atoms that are bound to each other. And due to some interactions that you have between electrons and water molecules, which you'll look at in the activity we do with this folder, we end up with a situation where water molecules are polar. So what I mean by that is one end of a water molecule, this oxygen end, has a negative charge to it. And the other end of the water molecule has a positive charge to it. So I've represented this positively charged end over here with the hydrogen atoms and this negatively charged oxygen end of the molecule over here. You guys have all heard the saying that opposites attract, right? And a positive charge and a negative charge are definitely opposites. And so what we have with water molecules is this attraction whereby the positive hydrogen end of one water molecule is going to be attracted to the negative oxygen end of another water molecule, just like magnets attract to each other. The problem with this has to do with the alveoli. So remember, these are teeny tiny microscopic structures. They have these really thin walls. And again, because they're at such a high humidity, there's lots of water molecules actually within the alveoli. So here's my representation of an alveolus here. You can see that simple squamous epithelium, that really thin wall. Of course, this is much more highly magnified than what an alveolus would actually be. We're talking about a microscopic structure here. But I want you to notice the water molecules. So we've got this positively charged hydrogen end represented in yellow on one water molecule that's attracting a negatively charged oxygen end on an adjacent water molecule. And what that's going to do is pull these water molecules towards each other. Water molecules also tend to stick to other things. So these water molecules also stick to the wall of the alveolus. And when you have water molecules that are stuck to the wall of the alveolus that are attracting each other, like these water molecules are doing in this drawing, what happens is the walls of the alveolus get pulled towards each other and it tends to cause the alveoli to collapse. So without surfactant, that would be the status of our alveoli. They would be collapsed. They would be incredibly difficult to inflate because of this attraction between water molecules, basically causing the walls to be attracted towards each other and collapsing in. So luckily, our lungs produce, and specifically the type 2 pneumocytes within the lungs, produce this chemical, which is known as pulmonary surfactant. You'll have a chance again in the activity that you do with this folder to look at the structure of pulmonary surfactant in a little bit more detail. However, what I want you to know about it here, just quick and simply, is that pulmonary surfactant has a positive end and it has a negative charged atom in it as well. And those are both found within what's known as the head of the pulmonary surfactant. Pulmonary surfactant also has two hydrocarbon chains or what we sometimes call tails that are not charged that branch off of the head portion. So what happens when pulmonary surfactant is produced in the alveoli and released into this area is the positive charge on pulmonary surfactant attracts to the negatively charged parts of an oxygen atom. So we've got that happening with these oxygen atoms here, pulmonary surfactant is attaching to it. And pulmonary surfactant, and specifically the negative charge on it, also attaches to positively charged water molecules. So there's the head and there's the tails I'm drawing in. This sets up a situation where this pulmonary surfactant effectively 
blocks the water molecules and gets in between them and prevents them from being able to attract each other. And if they can attract each other, then they don't pull the walls of the alveoli together and cause them to collapse. So that's why pulmonary surfactant is so important. In the activity that you do today, you're going to look at a very common condition with premature babies. Sometimes it happens in full-term babies as well. It's much more common in premature babies. And when babies are born prematurely, very often their lungs aren't fully developed and they aren't yet producing pulmonary surfactant. That used to be a death sentence for babies, not even that long ago. And you're going to learn about that in the activity that you do today. Luckily, in this day and age, we have a lot of treatments now that work to be able to prevent death from this particular condition and help the baby's lungs to be able to develop.